Okay, do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so hello, good morning. I'm Rodolfo, I work for Red Hat on the OpenShift team, and I'm gonna share with you a bit of my recent experience with Ansible. I hope it will be useful for you. So who here knows or have used Ansible before? Okay, so a lot of you, that's interesting. Uh, all right, so this will be like pretty basic. Do, uh, I hope you might learn something new. I'll try to go like from basic to something a bit more advanced. Uh, so yeah, so for those who don't know what is Ansible, uh, it is at least two things. It's both an automation language and the automation engine that understands that language. And the idea is that it should be something simple in, in various ways. It should be simple to install, to configure, to understand. Uh, it's also different than other software on the same category of automation. It doesn't require an agent uh, in the machines you are automating. So it normally uses SSH, and I have a star there because as we see today, uh, you don't necessarily need to use SSH. There are other ways to connect to the machines you are automating. Uh, it's a very extensible tool and language. It's open source and it's written in Python. So that's why I'm talking about it in a Python conference. And I think very important, like we are here as a community conference and it's interesting that this project is also uh, very great in terms of community. So there are like almost 2,600 contributors on GitHub. So it's a very active Python project. Uh, yeah, so what can we do with Ansible, right? Uh, you can do a lot of things with Ansible. It's really up to your imagination. Uh, things that people normally do is configuration management, uh, deploying applications, provisioning, orchestration, and continuous delivery. Uh, in my team in OpenShift, we use Ansible for installing OpenShift in a cluster. So my story of Ansible is not very long. I, I started, uh, as, I, as I told you, I work on OpenShift for about two years now. Uh, last year I talked about OpenShift here. So this time, like since the end of the year, the end of last year, I started working in this project called OpenShift Ansible which is the installer for, for OpenShift. And as the name says, it's using Ansible. Uh, so yeah, I had no, no experience with Ansible at all. Like I, I've heard about it, but never, never really installed and used it. So like you're talking or you're hearing somebody who has just a few months experience with Ansible. Uh, and I, uh, I think different than a lot of people who work with Ansible, I don't come from uh, operations or sees the mean perspective, but I'm really a programmer. So I try to look at it as, okay, like, this is not really a, is it a programming language, is it not? Or what can I do uh, with it that I would do like in Python or, or other programming language? Uh, so how many of you here are, like, would call, your, call yourselves like a DevOps or sees the mean? Yeah, so a few of you, right? So um, I'm also, I feel like I'm talking to a lot of programmers. So I'll try to give like what my perspective, what are my feelings towards uh, automation with Ansible. So the learning curve is, is really interesting because I felt like I went from zero to not a hero, like I don't claim to be an expert, but from zero to a good level of understanding in, in really like a few weeks. And we we'll even see today like how we can go a bit beyond the basics uh, if you start using Python on top, on top of Ansible. So let's start at the basics. So uh, like I try to think about like Ansible uh, with at least four, four things you have to have in mind. The first thing, uh, if you're automating something, you need to declare what this something is. So you have this thing called the inventory. It's basically where you describe uh, the targets of your automation. Uh, and then, yeah, you know what you want to automate, right? Like what machines or, or systems. And then you have a task, which is the minimum unit of action, right? You say like what tasks need to be done in these targets. 
Uh, then you have a group of tasks become something called a play. And you put a lot of plays together and you have a playbook. Is that clear so far? Yeah. So these are the basics. So normally uh, in an inventory, as I see, like Ansible used in the, in the wild, you have a list of remote hosts, right? And they're normally bare metal or virtual machines. So for example, you can start uh, some instance on Amazon or DigitalOcean, and then you're gonna put there the IP addresses of, of those uh, machines in your inventory, and you, and you work with that. Uh, so again, my perspective as a programmer, uh, yeah, like when you're programming, if you're doing something like single-threaded, single-process, uh, like in one programming language, Python, right? You, you open the interpreter. It's very easy to get feedback, right? You type two plus three and you get five immediately. You don't wait several minutes. There's no problem, like a network fails and then you don't get the answer, right? You don't have to worry about a lot of things. Uh, but that's not really true with infrastructure, right? So infrastructure, there are so many things that can go wrong. Uh, so, like, what I realized that why are you using Ansible? That, like, if I had for everything I want to develop or I want to automate, if I have to start multiple VMs uh, or, or like, provision real machines to do it, it, it wouldn't work. Like, it, it's so much work and so laborious, so slow that I cannot stand that. So, testing in this infrastructure world is hard. Like, you see a lot of people talking, like you can find on YouTube, like testing approaches for, for automation. And, and it, it's not something like as trivial as using unit test library in Python. So the one thing that is possible is to use containers. And Ansible, starting from I think some months or, or about a year ago, supports containers natively. So for me, like the, the big like piece of advice for experimenting with Ansible is that you don't have to have, like you don't have to pay Amazon for doing it. You can just start containers in your uh, local machine and you can simulate a cluster of uh, many, uh, many systems, right? Many hosts in your single host. So let's look at how an inventory looks like. We'll go through some examples just to give an idea uh, how these things work. So the inventory I have here, uh, it's basically that list of targets. And the interesting thing is that we can group the targets, right? So we can talk about uh, groups of hosts or groups of targets, uh, targets of your automation. So this example is something uh, that I took from the OpenShift Ansible project, how you install an OpenShift cluster. So in an OpenShift cluster, uh, so OpenShift, for those who never heard about it, it's an orch orchestration platform for containers. So when you install it, it you have uh, one or more masters, and then you have nodes, which are the, the machines, the, the hosts that execute your containers. Uh, so as you see here in this inventory, we have uh, a list of two nodes. And there are other groups that are empty. So we have etcd, lb for load balancer, and nfs. And then there's this special uh, notation that you can say uh, there is a group, osc, v3, and children. So now you can make groups of groups. So we had, we had declared the like, groups, master, nodes, and so on, the first five. And then I would say now that there is a general group that is composed of all of those groups. Uh, and you can also set variables. For example, you can set uh, what type of deployment you're doing or highlight there in the bottom. Uh, yeah, I think it's visible. Uh, you can say Ansible connection and set it to Docker. So instead of using the, the more common SSH connection type. Uh, we are going to use Docker to talk natively uh, to containers in your host. So I think this, this is the interesting part. 
so then the playbooks, right? Playbooks, again, the collection of plays and tasks, which is essentially uh, the things you're trying to automate. Uh, so different than if you're doing automation with more arcane tools like writing bash scripts or, or Python scripts, uh, when you're doing those scripts, you're normally telling what you do like step by step, right? You say, do this, do that, uh, and so on. And the idea with Ansible is, is a bit different. You, you basically say, what is the desired state of the system that you want, right? So you describe how it should be, and then Ansible will try to converge uh, the, the current state of the systems to the state that you declare is what you want. So here I have an example that we can use to start uh, containers in your, in your host. So uh, a playbook has a name, and we say like to each host it apply. So the host here could be something from the inventory, or it can always be local host, right? So you can always work on your current uh, machine where you execute Ansible. So connection local, it means again, I'm bypassing SSH and talking, uh, like executing commands natively. Uh, then this become no means I don't need to change the, the user. I don't need to uh, escalate privileges. And I don't want to gather facts, so I don't need to. So normally, like when you start automation, to know in which state you are, right? If you're just describing the desired state, you need to know in which state you are to be able to move to the state you want. So uh, Ansible normally gather facts about the host it's, it's working on. Uh, but in this case, we don't need to know any anything. We just want to start containers so we can speed it up and say no. And then comes the list of tasks. In this case, there's only one task, which is uh, which is starting uh, three containers. So again, looking at the programmer's perspective, this is YAML, right? Are we all familiar with YAML as a as a language? Yes. So YAML is is like it's more for describing data, right? You have uh, you have a list, you have dictionaries. It's not really a programming language. So it, it felt like a bit weird to me, like how, how am I gonna express what I need with this language? So Ansible provides some constructs, some things that make your YAML look a, a bit more like a programming language. So for example, this with items uh, key here, it, it, it basically means take, uh, take this task and repeat it like three times, once per item. And then we can replace this variable uh, item with the value. So we start three containers, right? The first one will be called master container and then node container one, node container two. So it's a different way to think about programming. Uh, personally, I run into the, uh, I already run into the situation where I wanted like, oh, I feel like I want to create a function or I want to uh, do things that I'm used to do in Python and it's very hard to do with YAML, right? Like code reuse. So yeah, how do we take all that and, and do something useful with it, right? So we can execute the, this automation using the command called Ansible Playbook. Uh, so we pass to it the list of hosts, that was our inventory file and then the playbook. So these are, are exactly the, the files we saw before. And then what it does, it's, uh, it, it goes and executes like, each task sequentially. So, well, it's getting dark. I think that, I hope that improves. Yeah, is it better to see the screen? I guess so, yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, so running, running Ansible playbook will go and run task tasks one by one sequentially in every, uh, in every host, in every target host. So in this case, our target was local host, only one target. Uh, and, and we see that we started the three containers. And the interesting thing about Ansible is that it tries to give you an idea of uh, not just 
that things succeeded or failed, but also if any change was made during the execution of, of this playbook, of this automation. So the idea, again, as a programmer, you try to do something that is common in functional programming, that you have, you, you try to have a lot of pure functions, so functions that, given some input, return always the same output, and they are easier to reason about. They have no side effects. So again, like you go to this infrastructure world, and we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to write uh, automation blocks that Again, like you can, for example, run them twice, and it should have the same effect on the system, right? So you should always be able to iteratively rerun re your playbooks, and you get feedback, like if something changed or not, right? So this this is the second uh, the second value there in the bottom. We have OK one, so there was one task that executed and was good, and one task that changed the state of the system. So when we run this for a second time, the containers are already started, uh, we will get OK1 and change 0, because nothing changed. Right, so then let's go to another playbook. How do, how do we remove containers? Right? So I'm, I'm showing you this, like how to start and stop containers, because this is one of the things I felt like was really interesting to simulate like these clusters. So you give you like a, you can create a bigger cluster, like with tens or, or hundreds of containers, uh, which is much more resource friendly than, than starting VMs in your laptop. So here's how we would go and remove containers. Essentially, the only difference from the previous playbook is that we changed the state. We say now instead of containers should be started, it should be absent. So Whenever you execute this, we will again like get a, a run of sequential tasks. We we'll see that it changed the state of the system, and the end result is that the containers were removed. Right? Okay, so this I think this is it for the basics, right? You you start playing with Ansible. And on your first week, you're probably going to try to do this, like you try to. So I suggest you, like, inst instead of trying to set up something on DigitalOcean or, or some other provider or start a lot of virtual machines, just, like, use these two, two playbooks I showed you to start containers. And you can start playing with automation. Like, you can do whatever you want in the container and, like, then throw it away. It was a very, very good tool for playing with Ansible. So now we'll go to some more like extra concepts and I think like trying to go to some more fancy stuff, if you will. So the next thing like I didn't tell you before, but like what was the task, right? So we had tasks and tasks are normally powered by modules. So modules are, uh, they are the actual code that execute some task, right? So, for example, if we go back here, uh, we have a task, it has a name, and then we say Docker container. This Docker container is the name of a module. So we are using Docker container module and passing it arguments, name and state. And this module takes care of doing what it's supposed to do, right? So it, it does remove, for example, remove or create containers as it needs. Uh, and the cool thing is that Ansible, just like Python is batteries included, Ansible is also batteries included. It comes with over 700 modules. So when you install Ansible, you already have like 700 automation blocks that can do things like uh, install packages on your system using yum, dnf, apt, uh, you have uh, like a lot of networking tools, you have things to change configuration files, uh, there are like, many, many things. So again, I'm not familiar with maybe not even 100 of those modules, but the cool thing is that you can, like, if, if you're trying to do something specific, you probably search for a module and it already exists, and maybe it's already 
in your installation of Ansible, right? So, yeah, so then we have roles. Uh, and the idea of roles is to standardize the organization of playbooks. So again, looking at the programmer's perspective, if you're just writing playbooks, it's like you're writing a lot of uh, Python scripts that you throw away, right? You, you write something, you use it, and then like it's something messy, you just you know, wrote it in, in 15 minutes and, and never look at it again. Uh, and then at some point you want to start organizing better, right? So in Python you start creating modules and packages and importing your modules from other modules and try to compose things. So here's the idea in Ansible is to use these roles. The roles are very similar to the playbooks, you also have your tasks, variables, and so on. Uh, but they are reusable, and they can depend, they can declare dependencies on other roles. And the way to share your code is either in whatever way you want, right, as a copy-paste thing. But there is this uh, site called Galaxy, Ansible Galaxy, that allows you to look for, it's like a marketplace, right? It allows you to look for existing roles you can download them, you can upload your, your roles that you create. So for example, imagine you, you create a role to do something very interesting like, uh, for example, you could create a role for controlling the lights of a room like this, right? So you have all the code related to like light automation. It knows how to talk to the, I don't know, Arduino board that can control the lights. So you do all of that, you package it, you upload it. It's like uploading to, to PyPI, right, in Python. So you can share your code with other people. And then somebody else can just like download it and use it immediately in the other room. So this is really cool. Uh, so yeah, why do we talk about this? Is that if those 700 modules that ship with Ansible are not enough for you, then that's when we are going to start writing Python code, right? So Ansible is written in Python. And even though like you can write modules in technically any language, like Python is the most common choice here. So there are already uh, in Ansible, like if you're using Ansible as a Python library, you have a lot, a lot you have already uh, some utility classes to help you creating modules. So modules, uh, they are, like I explain you what they are for, right? So in terms of code, what they really what they really are, like the, the contract you have with Ansible, is that you receive some arguments in standard out input and you spit out JSON in standard output. That's all you need. Right. So you could do this in any language from C uh, to other scripting languages like Ruby or JavaScript. Again, the normal choice is Python. And of course, like in my work with OpenShift Ansible, I had to soon figure out how to write modules. So we're trying to uh, we're trying to write uh, diagnostic checks for clusters, and because we are writing checks for OpenShift, which is the product we are developing, these things didn't exist as a module. They don't ship with Ansible, so I had to write modules to to do that. And here we have an example of a simple module, it comes with Ansible, it's the ping module. And like all it does, it's like you, you call it and it's supposed to reply pong. And it, and it serves the purpose of uh, making sure that you can access all of the target hosts in your inventory. So if you want to look at the code, it's, it's uh, like the first part there on the top, uh, we just tell what the arguments this this uh, this module can understand. And it's only one, it's a uh, data. And it's called data, right? And then we just return a result. There is a utility to return result as JSON and exit with a proper exit code. Zero means you're okay, and non-zero means your module failed. So you get a failed Task in the end of the run, right? So, if we use that module, we can use Ansible 
again pass minus i my host file, my inventory, and I want to run in all hosts. And so this time I'm running in all of those containers, right? The master and the two nodes that I created. And I can pass the module ping, the one we just saw. And I can pass that data, PyCon SK. And then it will go to every container and we'll get this response back, uh, ping PyCon SK. So the thing to keep in mind here is that the modules, they are executed in the target host. So they are copied over SSH or the other transport. So in this case, it's copied directly into the container and executes there. So for example, you could do things like uh, you could remove uh, everything like rm minus rf slash and you could, it's okay, like you could just remove everything from your container then you know how to start again, right? So this is, yeah, so can we do more than that? Are you excited to see more than that? Yeah? So <laughs> I was not satisfied with that, so we wrote modules and still, because we are doing diagnostics, uh, like normally Ansible, when you, when you run into a task and it fails, you stop, right? And you get, okay, this task failed, you should try to react, right? You as a sysadmin, you react, and then you, you run the playbook again. Uh, so the thing is that if you're doing diagnostics, you normally want to see all the diagnostics that failed, not just one, and then you fix it, and then you get the next one, and then the next one. Right? So you want to get an output of everything, uh, everything that uh, is failing in your cluster. So going further, the thing that I had to discover and, and work with uh, are the Ansible plugins. So I said that Ansible is extens extensible, and it really is. There are plugins for uh, basically every aspect of, of Ansible. Uh, I have three listed here. One is Action Plugin, Callback Plugin, and Connection Plugin. Those are three that I somehow got involved with. The Action Plugin, we will see an example, and Callback Plugin as well. And the Connection Plugin is basically what allows Ansible to connect between the control host to the targets. So normally we are using SSH, right? But as I said, it's possible to use other, other types of transport. So for containers, we use Docker API. We can use the local uh, to talk to local host. Uh, and you can actually write your own connection plugin. So if you have a, a different transport you want to use something fancy, you can write it and Ansible will, will use it. So let's go look at a, an action plugin, right? Uh, so action plugins and all the other plugins, they're normally, again, Python. So all you have to do in this case uh, is inherit from a specific class from Ansible. So for action plugins, it's called action base. And you need to implement this method run. <coughs> and what it does, it takes, uh, it takes all the variables that, that Ansible knows about, this, this task vars, and you do whatever you want there, it's Python code, and as long as you return a dictionary. So as a conclusion, yeah, I think it's time to learn Ansible. It's uh, a very good project, and it's very interesting to understand how it is, how you can use it to automate everything. Uh, it's a way to program the infrastructure, so not only you write code for like your, your product or your, your project, but also to how to set up and maintain the infrastructure that runs your code. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, like testing infrastructure is hard, but it's possible. And if you use some tricks, like using containers for simulating things, you can speed up and improve the, the feedback loop <coughs> that you get from testing. And again, we see that Python is a fundamental tool for us today, right? So. There are a lot of things that if you know Python, you're at home at. So that's very good for us. As a last thing I want to mention, I, I said I work for Red Hat, and this is not a hiring <laughs> talk, but if you are interested in knowing more about uh, Red Hat in Czech Republic, 
uh, if you're if you're looking for a, another opportunity uh, or or just to learn more about uh, Ansible or OpenShift, you can come talk to me or you can find us in the booth right out outside at the right, uh, out of the door. And yeah, like here is uh, like the list of things that Red Hat work on. Normally people just know that we are a Linux company and associate us with uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but that's not true. So I work there on the cloud computing front with OpenShift. Uh, and there is Ansible and there are solutions for storage and there are a lot of open source communities like Fedora that we also have a booth outside. And I think that's it and we'll go for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've already run out of time but uh, we have some questions. So uh, can you please uh, oh, yeah. uh, turn the questions on? Uh, so, uh, Okay, we see the same. Uh -huh. uh, is it possible to create private on-premise uh, Galaxy re repository, mm -hmm. repository of roles and yeah. so on? I don't know. I have no idea. Galaxy hasn't been open source yet. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how is our plugin for managing health check scheduled? How, how is uh, your plugin for managing health check scheduled? Uh, who is starting it and when? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it can either be started manually uh, by running Ansible Playbook with, uh, with a playbook that uses the Action plugin, or it can be automated by, for example, if you're running OpenShift, you can create a schedule job. It's something like a Chrome job that runs at a certain interval. Yeah, next. Uh, next one is, how does Ansible differ from Docker? Uh, what do you see as an uh, advantage or disadvantage? Okay, so they are completely different things. So Ansible is for automation. Uh, it's independent of Docker. And Docker is uh, one particular implementation of containers. Mm -hmm. So they are actually, they, as, I, as I, we saw, they can be used together. Right? I think that's the advantage is using them together. Uh, next question is uh, also about Ansible and Docker. So what are the minimal versions of Ansible and Docker that support the, the integration? Yeah, I think from Ansible 2.1 or 2.0 that there is integration with uh, Docker. Uh, I'm using 2.2 .2 now and 2.3 is out soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, the last the last question, uh, can we use Vagrant ins instead of Docker? Yes, we can use, so Vagrant again is also a generic, uh, is it like they are in different categories, right? Vagrant is a, is a tool for starting, uh, automating environments and you can use it normally with virtual machines. So if whoever asked was thinking about virtual machines powered by by Vagrant, yes, it's possible, but it's slower than containers, right? And it consumes more resources. You cannot start probably 100 virtual machines in your laptop, uh, but you can start 100 containers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we... <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you.